Our next speaker is Amy Simstead. Amy is a research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey Northern Prairie Wildlife Research Center, and she's actually stationed in the Wind Cave National Park in southwest South Dakota. Her position was created specifically to work with National Park Service units in the Northern Great Plains, which she has done for the past 20 years. Most of her work focuses on invasive plants and climate change adaptation in grasslands where fire, drought, and grazing always play a role. Her title today is Exotic Perennial Grasses Are Not Easily Moved, but Prescribed Fire Provides Some Utility. Please welcome Amy. So by the title, you can tell that it's it's uh, getting towards the end of the, the conference. And unfortunately, you've probably heard a lot of uh, what I'm going to say today. But I uh, add in the utility part because it's a little bit of a different twist. Um, to begin, I, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Heather Baldwin, who create, did the lion's share of the work to create a, a, the model that I'll be presenting results from today. Max Post Vanderberg, who um, uh, guided us through that process of building a model. And then, of course, the, our National Park Service, uh, I got this microphone, don't I? Um, our National Park Service uh, partners, there are too many to name by, uh, for individuals. Um, there's a lot of programs and parks involved in this uh, project. Um, and it's been a pleasure to work with them to synthesize vegetation monitoring data from some of those programs to be used by all of those programs in making their uh, decisions when it comes to managing their grasslands. Um, so as we all know, Great Plains grasslands are uh, highly adapted to frequent fire. Um, and beginning uh, back in the 1970s, I believe, some of the parks in the Northern Great Plains recognized that uh, keeping that out of the system wasn't a good idea. So they reinstated or they started doing prescribed fires. Um, and then about uh, 20, 30 years later, they realized maybe they should be seeing if those prescribed fires were having the desired results. So they established a fire effects monitoring program. Um, and that's been going on since 1998 in uh, 10 parks in the region. And um, their monitoring system is a point intercept uh, method where they're measuring the cover of all plants uh, that they encounter. Um, so to the species level, and they measure this one to two years before a prescribed fire and then one to um, five and 10 growing seasons after each prescribed fire. Then in 2011, the Park Service stood up nationwide uh, a, a monitoring program called the Status and Trends Monitoring Program. And the idea of that was um, to have a better idea of what's going on um, in terms of the natural resources um, uh, park-wide, um, not necessarily an effectiveness monitoring program. Um, but um, in one uh, rare flash of, of uh, government programs getting along and doing the logical thing, these two programs decided to use the same protocol for collecting vegetation data in the same parks. Um, but they do, uh, so uh, same type of data collected, but on a slightly different schedule, um, but still very compatible data uh, going into the exact same database, working very, two, two programs working two very closely together. Um, after uh, about five years of this uh, park-wide monitoring uh, had uh, been going on, we started to look at the data and we were particularly interested in the annual brome grasses because just by our experience in the field, it sure seemed like they were becoming uh, a bit of a problem. And the graph on the left uh, confirmed that, that we see that some of the parks, um, there's no trend line because they've always been pretty bad since the data started being collected. Others have uh, seen an increase in annual bromes, um, kind of going from bad to worse, but others started out with almost none and went um, from uh, having almost none to, to some areas having more than 50% cover of those uh, annual species. Um, of course, you're asking, why is she talking about annuals? We're here for perennials. So I quick pulled some data from uh, the last uh, 11 years of monitoring to see what was going on with the, uh, the perennials and uh, saw a similar uh, uh, picture, perhaps even a little bit worse um, in terms of their relative cover 
and they're being increasing in just the, the 10 years uh, from this data uh, in some of the parks. Um, but we're looking at this data, so we realized the issue that these, these parks have invasive grass problems that weren't being treated. Um, but another second issue was that they had all of this monitoring data, especially in the part or in the fire program that had um, was basically only being used to evaluate uh, the effectiveness of individual burns and not really being um, synthesized back into improving that fire management. So um, to take care of, or at least address two of those issues um, and inspired by NPAM, um, in 2017, we set up the annual Brome Adaptive Management Project, which is a consortium of seven park service units in um, kind of the Western part of the Northern Great Plains. So Western South Dakota, Western Nebraska, uh, Eastern Wyoming and Southeastern Montana. Um, and uh, the parks are obviously a pretty small part of the landscape, um, but uh, it's Im they're important to uh, those of us in this in this project. Um, so uh, the goal of uh, ABAM, just like for NPAM, is to um, maintain or, or attain high quality native vegetation while maximizing the cost efficiency of the management actions. But we call it ABAM for annual bromes um, first because NPAM took the better uh, the better name, but but also because um, we decided at the outset to focus on the annual bromes um, because the managers you know had kind of the co collective knowledge that the perennials are just really hard to deal with that they wouldn't have much luck in um, con in in reducing those. Um, uh, however, as the goals here show, um, it's, a, it's about native prairie, um, and we wanted to take uh, into account the fact that if you control one uh, invasive species, like the annual bromes that are up in the front here, um, you might actually make it uh, good for something else to move in, or you might, uh, or just flourish, which is the smooth brome in the, in the mid here. So our adaptive management program wanted to take into account that possibility and avoid it if possible. Um, so uh, structured adaptive management is a cycle of assessment, prediction, management action, and monitoring. We had the monitoring programs and we weren't going to mess those up. We, so we built our framework around those existing monitoring programs. And we had the management programs. What we needed was a way to, like I said, synthesize the information that's coming from those. And we decided to do that like NPAM uh, by building a decision support tool um, to aid in decision making. And uh, the ABAM decision support tool um, is um, uh, considering not just the annual bromes, but all of the components of the vegetation. And it combines those components into what we call vegetation conditions. Um, and the tool itself is a Bayesian network that quantifies basically the probability of transitioning from um, a current vegetation condition to a new vegetation condition um, in various environmental uh, contexts, uh, both static like soil conditions and, and, and also dynamic like weather um, at, under various management actions after different time, uh, periods of time. And I'll just note that we use the term vegetation condition instead of state because state has a very specific meaning, especially in the rangeland context, and, and ours doesn't meet that definition. Um, so um, the probability of, of being in a vegetation condition, and it's these conditions aren't, you know, you're in one or the other, you're, you have a probability of being in a variety of them. And that's because their definitions overlap somewhat. And those definitions are based on how much of each of these components up in the, the column names here are. And then also we include um, the uh, diversity of, of native species. So um, for example, it, when it comes to condition, the, the desired condition of course is high quality prairie, which is defined as having less than 5% total exotic cover, a low, um, 
or a high uh, native species richness and a good balance between forbs, native forbs and grasses. A simplified grassland has low exotic cover, but it's not very diverse. Exotic annual grassland, exotic perennial grassland and weedy forb mess, you know, you kind of get the idea there. They're, they're defined by their, um, their offensive uh, groups. Um, and then low quality prairie is kind of whatever's left. It's not quite, and it's not as bad as the, the, the weedy forb mess say, but it's definitely not as good as high quality prairie. Um, and I forget what else I was going to say for this slide because PDF made it all gibberish in my notes. So I hope I don't miss anything important. Um, okay, so um, to build our model, we started out by consulting the experts um, in terms of the um, uh, to make a conceptual model of how the system worked works. Um, and the main idea behind this was at, at first we thought we were going to do something like like Cami explained and have them put numbers on for, you know tra transition probabilities. But we realized, well wait a minute, we have all that monitoring data. Let's use that. But we did want their input on what variables we should consider to include in the model. And this is the outcome of that. I won't have you look at all of that, but it includes those, those dynamic and static variables that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, at this point, you can see that we are lumping all exotic perennial grasses together. Um, and we realize that that's, you know, we all know that Kentucky bluegrass and smooth brome act differently, but it, because our emphasis was on the annual bromes, we just lumped them together but we separated out the two annual brome species, uh, Japanese brome and uh, cheatgrass. Um, okay, so um, we have we had all that data. So we used that model to um, uh, plug into a, an R package um, called BN Learn and use the hill climbing algorithm in that to figure out how many of those arrows that we had and boxes that we had in the conceptual model are actually really supported by the data. And this was the outcome here. Um, and I won't, again, I'm not gonna go into the details of those, um, but one aspect of this type of model is that it works on categories for each of these variables as opposed to continuous variables. So we had to translate um, uh, uh, those into categories and we relied on another algorithm to objectively determine where the, the breakpoints in say high, medium, and low cover of uh, each of our vegetation components should be. And interestingly enough, this, uh, um, this algorithm, which uh, is designed specifically to reduce the amount of, or to, to minimize the amount of information that you lose by going from a continuous variable to a categorical, um, seems to seem to pick up that um, systems with no uh, uh, none, no cover of these, uh, either the exotic annuals or the exotic perennials uh, uh, function a little bit differently than those with some of them. And you can see, and I wanna emphasize that again, that these aren't necessarily ecological thresholds that um, would just define a state condition. It's just what was picked up by the algorithm. And you can see there, they're kind of low compared to uh, you know some of the um, thresholds that we might see in a, a, a ecological site model, for for example. Um, okay, so we have our uh, the the structure of the environmental variables and the vegetation components. Now we got to bring in the management, um, and that of course uh, came down to speaking to the managers and what they thought. Um, uh, belonged in their uh, decision uh, making. Um, we decided very early on um, that the only feasible tools for managing the vegetation in the parks were um, prescribed fire and herbicides. And of course, the herbicides that we were working with were targeted towards the annual bromes. So not really all that relevant to the, um, the perennials because they're targeting either em emerging or, or very young plants. Um, and uh, Let's see, something is supposed to appear here. Oh, okay, uh, that doesn't, uh, uh, we had a lot of data for the, the fire and that's what's relevant to the perennial grasses. So that's what I'll be talking about, but I'm showing all of these other uh, uh, management options because it explains why we 
basically lumped all fall burns and all spring burns together instead of trying to separate those out more phenologically. Basically, we didn't, we couldn't have too many actions in the model. Otherwise, we'd never get enough information to have to fill in the, the blanks. Um, and um, another reason that it's just lumped into fall or spring burn is that our fire managers um, were adamant that they didn't want to be told that they should be burning at a certain leaf stage of a given plant. Um, <laughs> so I think we all know why um, they were complaining about that. Um, so, um, all right, so then we used the data that we had from the prescribed fire program to parameterize the model in terms of what management did. Um, and when we, we used that same algorithm, we found that the only arrows that showed up, that the, the direct links from management um, to any of our vegetation components were to those exotic components, um, the exotic grasses even, not the forbs. Um, so uh, that kind of shows in uh, that the the native species, you know, fire. That's you know what they grew up with. Doesn't bother change them much. Um, okay, so where am I? Okay, so what does our model say about fire's effects on perennial grasses in these parks? Um, to answer that question, we basically just summarized the the output of the model for for three different starting conditions. The high quality prairie with low exotic perennial grass um, abundance, the low quality prairie with medium uh, exotic uh, component, and then the exotic perennial grassland with high according to those levels that you, some of you might be able to see down at the bottom. Um, okay, so um, here's the results. Uh, again, lots of numbers. Um, that are, um, I'll try to walk you through in, in interpreting. So the number it's in, in all the tables that you'll see in the next few slides represent the probability of the exotic perennial grass cover being in the, I haven't been able to get the pointer thing to work. So being in the after column um, at, at a certain time step, one, two to three or four to five years, growing or growing seasons since the management actions so the fire either in fall spring or not occurring so this slide focuses purely on maintenance which means that the the before and the after levels of those uh, exotic perennial grasses is the same and the the big take home message and the reason that um i i changed my title to these things are stubborn is because um, the highest probability for any management action almost in any time step is that you're going to stay in the same level that you started out with. But you can see that these numbers are not all 0.99 or 1. There is, there, it, it isn't always going to stay like that. So let's see if there's some um, hope uh, of changing, moving things a little and which direction they go. And I'll start with the most invaded areas. So, so that starting out in the high uh, com condition, um, again, the maintenance levels that were in the previous slide are, are all uh, shown here. But what I wanna look at with now is, is there any chance of getting to that low, lower levels with prescribed fire? And uh, one year or one growing season out after a fall spring fire, or sorry, a fall prescribed fire, we do see some chances of improvement. Um, and it's actually, you know, you got a 50-50 chance or better than a 50 chance, 50 chance of, of improving rather than just uh, staying um, in that high level. Um, however, um, that's just one year after the fire. That's the wrong arrow. Um, two years or two to three years out, um, the spring and the fall fire are looking about the same in terms of your chance of improvement, um, but the chances is lower than it was in that one year after. And then four to five years out, um, the spring fire is looking better. Um, what happens if you're in moderately invaded areas? So starting out in the medium level. Well, um, the fall fire there is actually being fairly consistent in that you have a higher probability of improving than you do of getting worse, getting to that high level. 
about twice as high usually throughout all those time steps. Um, so fall fire is looking pretty good for those moderately invaded areas. Um, and But in the longest term, spring fire is showing the best improvement. Um, and notably, however, um, no action is showing the greatest chance of you getting in a worse condition of going up, which we've all seen um, before. Um, in the least invaded condition, um, uh, again, maintenance is the most likely thing, um, whether or not you, you burn or not. Um, but uh, spring fire actually has a fairly high chance of uh, worsening your condition, or the it has the, the highest chance of worsening your condition compared to the other uh, uh, doing the nothing or the fall fire. Um, and uh, fall fire offers the low or the highest probability of maintaining the, the low invasion in, in all but the, the shortest term. Um, so I guess um, to sum it all up, as in most of ecology, what does um, fall or what does fire do to pr exotic perennial grasses in these systems? It depends. Um, and that's pretty much the same story for the annual grasses, just in case you're wondering. Um, the results are also fairly messy. However, generally improvement is more likely than maintaining the, your state um, or worsening. But of course, it depends on your starting point. Uh, and in fact, burning in uninvaded areas seems to in, have a risk of opening up um, the area to invasion by the annual species. And it depends on species. So just as you know, smooth brome and Kentucky bluegrass differ, it's interesting to see that uh, at least what we're initially seeing is that Japanese brome and cheatgrass are susceptible at, in different seasons of the year. Uh, burn seasons. So given all these complexities and contingencies, the conundrum that we heard in, in our last talk about helping the, your native species with a spring fire, or hurting a native species with a spring fire, but also har hurting your, your Kentucky bluegrass, what's a manager to do? Well, this is where the utility comes in part. Our um, decision support tool doesn't just say what's gonna to happen to the vegetation, it quantifies how happy the managers will be with the change in vegetation by um, multiplying basically their preference for each of these different conditions by the probability of being in that condition. And when you do that, you get a single number um, that describes um, your current utility for a given management unit, um, what will happen, what the model projects will happen if you don't do anything. Um, it identifies the optimal action um, given your conditions um, and what your utility of that will be. Or, and then it also compares the action or the utility of doing nothing um, or th that action or our fall or spring burn actions, because that's the, the easiest thing to, to think of on a management wide scale. It compares that to doing nothing. Basically, you don't have to look at these numbers uh, to, you don't have to, but the managers do look at these and they can um, evaluate, you know, will we get the most um, utility? Will we be happiest by doing something in this management unit versus that management unit? Um, and uh, it's it's a, a lot easier way of making, or it, it makes it possible to make a decision in all of the, in the face of all of this complexity. Um, so uh, to wrap up, um, as we all know, perennial exotic grasses are stubborn, um, but prescribed fire offers some um, uh, promise of, of reducing them. Um, and decision support tools can uh, use data, uh, are, are, are a good way of using the data that we collect to help managers deal with that or complex ecological behavior. Um, we've only actually been using the model for two years. Um, but uh, you know we have all of that back year's data from the monitoring programs, um, and based on that, we we know we what we would like to do to improve the model already at this stage. First of all, of course, splitting out Kentucky bluegrass and smooth brome would be good, um, and then we'd also like to be getting into more detailed analyses of the fire effects 
Um, we do have severity data for most of the prescribed fires. Um, we uh, can look at weather before and, and the weather after the fires. And so just, just dig into it a little bit more, see if we can hone in or to, to tailor the prescribed fire actions to uh, get the best results even more. And I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>